Great. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our pollinator webinar. Uh, my name is Christine Ombre, and I am Ontario Nature's Conservation Education Coordinator. Ontario Nature is an environmental charity dedicated to protecting wild species and wild spaces through education, conservation, and public engagement. I would like to thank our members and donors for making our work possible through their support and generosity, and would also like to thank all of you for taking the time for joining us this morning. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land where Ontario Nature's head office is and where I am joining today from Toronto or Toronto. This place is in the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. Toronto is also covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty, treaty Number 13, and this territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy, the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples have inhabited Turtle Island, which are still home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, we acknowledge that Indigenous communities continue to be impacted by the intergenerational trauma inflicted by residential schools reflective of the systems of colonialism, oppression, and cultural genocide. We recognize our collective responsibility to learn the truth and advance reconciliation, both as individuals and as an organization. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather on this territory, even virtually, and through this land acknowledgement, our intent is to honor and show gratitude to the original stewards of the land as a sign of respect and willingness to learn and heal, being mindful of broken promises and reconciling with all our relations. Together, may we care for this land and each other, drawing on the strength of our mutual history of nation building through peace and friendship, being mindful of generations to come. So a few housekeeping items for everybody. This webinar is being recorded. All attendees are in listen and view only mode, which means others cannot see or hear you. To ask questions, please use the Q&A feature. We will follow up with any unanswered questions via email that were not addressed today. To make a comment or ask for help with technical difficulties, please use the chat function. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce one of our speakers for today, Jessica Yu, a dedicated member of the Ontario Nature Youth Council. Jessica is an 11th grade student from Toronto who is passionate about nature. To protect pollinator biodiversity, she is involved with the Youth Council's Bringing on Biodiversity campaign and spearheading the Be the Change initiative at her school, University of Toronto Schools. During her free time, she enjoys gardening with her family, writing poems, and watching baking videos on YouTube. Jessica, take it away. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I'm so excited to be here. I would first like to start off by introducing who the Youth Council is before talking about Ontario Nature's work with pollinators and Be the Change at UTS, a special spaces event I'm leading at my school. The Ontario Nature Youth Council is a network of youth across Ontario from ages 14 to 20. We are a diverse group united by our love for nature. We're dedicated to inspiring, connecting, and educating our communities while protecting wild species and wild spaces. Personally, Youth Council has been a journey. From learning and taking action to conserve nature, to making friends with similar interests, Youth Council has become an integral aspect of my life. Buzz. What initiatives do we focus on? First of all, we take actions on conservation issues such as pollinators and biodiversity. A few months ago, during a government consultation period, Youth Council members created a video and submitted a letter on advocating and protecting the green belt. This was shared with government officials. The Bringing on Biodiversity campaign is one of the Youth Council's newest projects. The goal is to preserve Ontario biodiversity by rallying youth to lead their communities through projects and education by completing a set of criteria. Our campaign has also been giving presentations to schools and partnering on biodiversity webinars with organizations like Friends of the Rouge Watershed. We have also had Youth Council members share their naturalist knowledge virtually with each other and to the public. 
This included an introduction to birdwatching webinar, Ontario Fish ID, and Native Trees of Ontario's Forest drop-in workshops. Buzz. Notably, we plan and host events, including the annual Youth Summit in September, connecting a diverse group of young leaders across Ontario, and local, our special spaces events. Last year, we worked alongside Youth Circle for Mother Earth Project partners and youth to plan and lead our virtual Youth Summit for Mother Earth and look forward to working with them again for 2021. Our special spaces events are planned and led by youth council members in their local community and have been running them since 2011. These include shoreline cleanups, plantings, invasive species removals, learning about community science initiatives like, like Bumblebee Watch and more. We have engaged over 2,300 volunteers and have planted over 21,400 native plants across the province. Buzz. To protect Ontario's pollinators, Ontario Nature has collaborated with the Youth Council, Farms, and Health and other environmental organizations. Since 2014, Ontario Nature and its Youth Council have initiated a pollinator campaign. This includes educational presentations and asking the Premier to restrict the use of neonicotinoids, the harmful insecticides known to severely affect bee populations, through letters and postcards. Since the campaign was initiated, Youth Council members have given numerous presentations to schools, other youth during our Youth Summit, and encourage communities to commit to protecting pollinators. Eight youth council members have gotten their cities or schools certified as B cities and B schools through B City Canada, including my school just this year. Very exciting, buzz. There has been a focus on advocacy work, especially for the banning of neonicotinoid pesticides in Ontario. Ontario Ontario Nature has gone to court to protect pollinators from two harmful pesticides and advocated against regulatory changes that would undermine Ontario's restrictions on neonicotinoids. Ontario Nature also raises awareness about pollinators to the public and encourages fellow Ontarians to plant pollinator-friendly plants. This has been done through media, social media, and events such as this very webinar. Resources and videos can be found at our pollinators webpage linked at the bottom right. The work Ontario Nature and the Youth Council has done for pollinators inspired me to advocate for pollinators in my community. Knowing that Youth Council members have the opportunity to plan and lead their own special spaces events during the year, I wanted to run my own events, but with a twist, especially because we couldn't gather in person. Buzz. Be the Change at UTS is a project I'm leading at my high school, University of Toronto Schools, with a team of student executive members and our staff supervisor, Ms. Straczynski. Our goal is to distribute 200 pollinator garden kits across the greater Toronto area, made possible thanks to the broad catchment of our community. Each pollinator garden kit contains four to five seedlings, four types of seed species, all in a branded carry bag, as you can see from the picture on the right. These plants are all native perennial plant species that provide habitat, food, and nesting places for pollinators. We also provide participants with garden support, including Q&A meetings, webinars, and contact through email and social media. Be the change at UTS, um, Buzz, Be the change at UTS, has been possible thanks to the wonderful support from our school community. During this pandemic, UTS connected over our love for nature and desire to preserve pollinator biodiversity. We hosted regular volunteer bees or meetings where more than 27 students joined. They came together to gather plant data and create materials for our website, including the fun rebuses on the right 
uh, rebuses are basically puzzles where the images here form like words. And in this case, it would be pollinator related words. So as you can see from the example at the top, this these pictures would form topsoil because of the picture of the top plus S plus oil. And I thought it would be really fun to show it to everyone here. And maybe we could try two more together. So what do you think the first one, um, the, the second row says? What word do you think that says? Oh, please feel free to type in your guess in chat and we can reveal it soon. I'll give five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. Pollinate, um, Buzz, mind clicking to reveal the, uh... yeah. And what about the picture after that? Feel free to type it in. Five, four, three, two, one. Buzz. The answer is honeycomb. Everyone's right. So that, that was really fun. And um, other than these puzzles for our websites, we have also started an in-school logo contest to find our perfect logo, which is in the top left. And other art is going to be used for our future websites. Buzz. We invited speakers for Be The Change speaker seminar series from other organizations to educate our community on issues such as youth environmental activism and the importance of pollinators. The Ontario Nature Youth Council joined us too for our first se session with the picture on the right. Finally, our team collaborated on a presentation at Simcoe County District School Board, where we shared our project with other schools and hopefully inspired them to take action as well. Buzz. During Pollinator Week this year, we were officially certified as a B school and we celebrated as a community. This featured special Pollinator of the Day posts on our Instagram and a Zoom party where we introduced more puns and puzzles. And once again, I would love to share them with everyone here because they're just so fun. So buzz on the next page. All right, so let's get started with these puns. Feel free to type them out in chat if you find the answer. So what do bees use to build roads? I'll give five seconds. Buzz. Nectar, or should I say nectar, haha. <laughs> All right, second question. Who is a bee's favorite singer? All right, I feel like there are multiple answers for this. Yes, multiple answers. I only wrote one, but it's, it's all correct. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Buzz. I put Beyonce, but all of those answers are correct. All right, third question. Why do bees have sticky hair? Very good question. Five, four, three, two, one. Buzz. <laughs> because they use honeycomb. Okay, that's very very silly puns. All right, so let's do let's play um an unscrambler here. So I have a picture of a native pollinator and then you can try to unscramble it to find their actual name. So what do you think this species is? Five, four, three, two, one. Buzz. Checkered beetle. So the people in the chat are right. And I have two more on the next page, two of these unscramblers. All right, so what's the first one here? What is this creature? Five, four, three, two, one. Buzz. It's a mining bee. And what about the other one? Five, four, three, two. Ooh, a lot of answers. One. Buzz. Swamp milkweed, good job. All right, let's go on to the next slide now. Buzz, buzz. Be the Change is a long-term initiative 
And from here on, pollinator activism at UTS will only grow and evolve. I'm now going to head it off to our next speaker to talk more about pollinators and climate change. Peter Soroye is a conservation biologist and PhD student at University of Ottawa, studying how climate change and the habitat loss affect pollinators like bumblebees. Peter is also a passionate science communicator and advocate for increasing equity, inclusion, and diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. All right, handing it off to Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and thank you so much for the for the invitation to be here uh, to Ontario Nature. Thank you for letting me geek out about pollinators and climate change for a little bit. And thank you for uh, letting me share the virtual stage with, with Jessica and Christine who are doing such amazing work with uh, the Youth Council and, um, and, and really be in the change. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for those amazing puns, Jessica. That was amazing. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Ottawa. So I'm coming from uh, unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory uh, in Ottawa. And I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, my PhD work focuses on uh, looking at how climate change and habitat loss are impacting pollinators across North America and Europe. But obviously, pollinators in Ontario are, are really close to my heart. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to share some of that with, with everyone here. And, uh, and hopefully we can all learn something new together. Um, I'm going to check in uh, and try to engage with people at a couple points during the talk. And so if you have questions or comments, throw them in the chat, I have it open and I'll be uh, keeping a little lookout uh, as I go. Um, and of course, if you have questions at the end, happy to answer and if you don't get to them here, then answer them via email. Um, and so I'll have a couple of quizzes and polls and a couple of, of uh, questions to everybody. So please uh, feel free to, to join in and put your answers there uh, when that happens. Uh, next slide, please, Buzz. Um, in Ontario, we're, we're super lucky to have a really great diversity of pollinators. Um, and so the first question I'm gonna ask everybody is, what is your favorite pollinator? It can be in Ontario, it can be uh, elsewhere in Canada or, or beyond, but let me know what your favorite pollinator is and where's your favorite place to go to look for pollinators. Um, and as I wait for those, to, for those answers to come in, um, we'll just talk about some of the diversity, some of the incredible diversity of pollinators that we have here in Ontario. Um, butterflies and bees are some of the, the first ones that come to mind. Um, certainly for me, butterflies were some of the first pollinators that I really started to appreciate. Butterflies are so gorgeous, the patterns are absolutely stunning. And once you start to look at them and see, you know, pay attention to these, you know, for me, it started with butterflies. But once you start to see these little things, um, it opens up a whole world I find, of, of little animals, little invertebrates, mostly in insects. Um, and uh, and it you know creates a whole other world for you to look into. Um, some amazing uh, answers pouring in the chat. Hawk moths. Moths are incredible pollinators as well. Um, and of course, pollinate at night uh, sometimes. So uh, kind of an amazing niche that they fill there. Um, in Ontario, we have uh, not a lot of birds that, that directly pollinate, but hummingbirds are obviously fantastic and, and super exciting to watch if you ever have the pleasure of, of watching them go flower to flower. Um, some underappreciated pollinators that we have here in Ontario and, and across the world are flies. They play a huge role, contribute a lot to pollination. Um, and even though we don't notice them as much or we don't pay as much attention to them, um, they play a big part in the pollination um, that plants require. Um, of course, for this talk, uh, you know, what I study is mostly bees, and uh, in my mind, bumblebees are far and away the greatest insects of all time. So we're going to focus mostly on, on bees for the rest of this talk. Um, but that's not, to, that's not to diminish the importance of these other uh, incredible pollinators that we have. Um, but to start out, um, it can often be difficult, uh, you know, to tell bees from other insects, especially um, when we start to get to, to mimics of bees, um, which is a, a popular phenomenon in the, in the natural world. And so I'm gonna start off, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll start off with a little bit of a quiz. Um, so we're gonna have a poll pop up on screen. And uh, if you played Among Us over the pandemic in the last year and a bit, this is the equal to that. Um, so what I'm gonna ask everyone to do is guess who the imposter is in these three animals. Um, so the A, B, and C, three different insects on the screen. Um, and if you could guess which of these are bees, if there are bees, 
Um, that would be great. Take a, a couple seconds, think about it, um, throw in your answer. I'll answer it as well. And, um, and if you're feeling particularly bold, then yeah, type into the chat uh, which one you think is the imposter, which one you think is the real B, um, or, or what you suspect the answer to be. Um, and I'll give people a couple more seconds to, to answer. And then um, if we could close the poll in a little, in a couple of seconds, that would be great. And we'll, we'll get the answer. Some, uh, some great answers. The poll is anonymous as well. So if you're not super confident, just throw your answer in the poll and, uh, and no one will see if you're right or wrong. Um, but shout out to all the bold people typing into the chat what they think. All right, if we could close the poll and show the answers, that would be awesome. Um, this was, uh, most people got it, most people got this one right. So uh, B and C, oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, the, this was a bit of a trick question. I'll count this as most people being right, but the correct answer was not actually in the poll, um, my bad. Um, but C is the only B here. Um, a and B are actually flies in this picture, um, showing again kind of that importance of flies as pollinators. But uh, we'll go over in a, in a couple of minutes the best ways to tell apart bees and other flies, um, because sometimes they can look quite similar, like we can see here. Um, most people said that B, uh, that B and C were flies, uh, B and C were bees, sorry, and C is the bee. C is a, an orange belted bumblebee, which is a pretty common one that we have across here in Ontario. Uh, absolutely wonderful to see with these bright uh, belts on them. Um, and a is, a is a hoverfly, I believe, um, and B is another uh, bee mimic, but it's, but it's actually a fly. And so we'll talk in a little bit about how you can best tell apart bees and flies, because sometimes they can be quite similar. Um, if we could go to the next slide, we'll do uh, a round two. And, um, and so for this one, again, same idea. We've got three, three animals on here. Um, and if you can guess which one are the bees, if there are bees, um, then that would be that would be fantastic. And actually, I see here that uh, I think the answers to the polls were switched. Um, so if you could imagine that answer B, the second option in the poll is A and B are Bs. Um, actually, we'll just we'll close the poll. That's that's great. I see. Uh, we have, uh, okay, so the early results were a little, uh, were a little uh, conflicted. Um, and I'll just, I'll just share the answer with everybody. So this was a bit of a trick question, I'll be honest. Um, C is not a bee. C is a clear wing hummingbird moth or a hawk moth, as they're often called as well. Um, and they're absolutely gorgeous pollinators, um, but they're not bees. Um, they're, they're actually moths. They're incredibly cool to watch if you ever get the chance to see them in the woods uh, somewhere in Ontario. Um, they're, yeah, super cool to watch. But A and B are bees. Um, and it's a little bit of a trick question. A here is a carpenter bee, so it has much less fur than we would normally, or, or hair on it than we would normally associate with a bee. But carpenter bees are, are really cool. They're the ones that might burrow into your porches or into any wood sort of uh, surface. Um, incredibly cool types of bees. B is, uh, this is the, trick that I threw in here, um, because it's actually not a bee you'll ever find in Ontario. This is a Himalayan cloak and dagger bee. And I wasn't going to put it into the into the talk. Um, I was going to put a wasp in here or something to see if you guys could tell those apart. Um, but I saw this picture of this neon blue bee, and I just couldn't resist throwing it in. I think it's, you know, an absolutely amazing animal and uh, really showcases some of the diversity of bees that we have across the world. Um, and I guess as a lesson, if you're ever on vacation, um, keep your eyes out for bees because you'll never know um, what types of forms they might come in. But on, in Ontario alone, there's clearly a diversity of bees, a huge diversity of bees. Aside from the, this, um, this uh, Himalayan cloak and dagger bee, all the other uh, animals in these poles, and most of the pictures you'll see here actually um, are, are of, on, of, on, of pollinators that you might see in Ontario. Um, so a really cool selection. Um, and now that we have a little bit of an idea of how tricky it is sometimes to tell bees apart. I'll give a little bit of a, a I'll live a, give a little bit of a lowdown and some tips on how to tell apart bees from other uh, common pollinators. So next slide, please. 
So the first is flies. Um, in that first uh, section of the poll, um, we saw that flies and bees can look incredibly similar sometimes, but there are a couple of dead giveaways. There are some pretty key characteristics you can use to tell them apart. Um, one of the biggest ones uh, kind of uh, in terms of their anatomy is bees tend to have two pairs of wings and flies only have one pair. This is a pretty clear one if you have them uh, right in front of you, but it's pretty difficult to tell even when they're just like sitting down. And usually if they're flying around, it's, it's a pretty impossible characteristic to determine them by. But the biggest uh, difference, the one that I use most of the time is to do with their antenna and their eyes. So flies have really short stubby antenna. You can see in this picture, it's uh, they're really short, really small, uh, coming off the top of their head, those little antenna. Whereas bees have really long, luscious antenna, much more similar to what we think of when we think of, you know, antennae flopping around on a head. The other big characteristic is their eyes. Um, if you ever see flies' eyes, they, they're super large. They really wrap around the front of their face as well. And there's very little space in between the two eyes of a fly in the center of its head. Bees, on the other hand, have a lot of space between their eyes. Um, the eyes are at the side of their head and they have a really big uh, forehead, I guess, in between their two eyes. So that's another big dead giveaway. If you see the eyes wrapping all the way around the head, um, even if it looks like a bee, same color, same shape, it might actually be a fly. And if you see those two stubby antenna, then you know for sure you're looking at a fly, not a bee. Um, so that's one, uh, some characteristics to tell apart these bees from flies. The other one that we'll go through, if we can go to the next slide, please, is telling apart bees from wasps. This is another uh, really uh, common question that I get a lot. And, you know, wasps we know are often super annoying as they invade our picnics, as they invade our, our sunset dinners in the summer. Um, but they're also really great pollinators. I'll throw that out as well. They contribute a decent amount to pollination as well. Um, but they can be difficult to tell apart. And even experts have a hard time often telling apart some groups of bees from wasps. Um, there are a couple of characteristics that you can usually use to tell apart bees and wasps. The first one is this really small hourglass waist that most wasps have, uh, or that pretty much all wasps have. So you can see in this picture, it's a really obvious difference between this honeybee on the, um, on the right hand side and this wasp on the left. Um, and uh, really, you know, it's a really obvious difference in that waist. Some groups of bees, especially cuckoo bees, like we'll see in a little bit, also have these really tight pinched waists. Um, but usually uh, this is a pretty good characteristic to tell whether you're looking at a, a wasp or a bee. The other one is the amount of hair that it has on it. If it's really fuzzy, it's probably a bee. Um, if, it's, if it doesn't have a lot of hair, uh, then it's probably a wasp. And this as well, a lot of cuckoo bees also tend to be pretty hairless. Um, so it's not a surefire characteristic, um, but usually those two things, the amount of hair that it has on it and how tight or small the waist is, um, are, are great characteristics for telling apart these animals. So now that we can tell apart bees from other common pollinators and other insects, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different groups of bees that we have across Ontario. Um, so that when you're looking at these beautiful bees, you can tell a little bit about them and a little bit about what they might be doing. So we're super, there are about 20,000 different species of bee across the world, uh, hundreds in Canada. And in Ontario, we have over 420 or about 420 different species of wild bees. Uh, and this is everything from these big fat bumblebees to, to shiny metallic sweat bees, to minor bees and carpenter bees and, and everything in between. Um, and so we'll go over some of these big groups of wild bees. But to put that in comparison, that 420 number, there are only about 80 species of mammals in Ontario. And that's everything from seals to whales, to bears, to deer, um, to squirrels, to mice, uh, and, and you know all of that. So a huge and incredible diversity of bees uh, alone in Ontario. The, the best group, according to me, this is my biased opinion, are bumblebees. They're thick, they're fuzzy, um, they're social, they live in colonies of a couple dozen to maybe a couple hundred. Um, and they're fantastic pollinators of uh, wild landscapes, of uh, uh, some crops as well. Um, and they're just so gosh darn and adorable. Um, you know, you look at them, how can you not fall in love with these, with these beautiful bees? Um, there are a handful of species of different bumblebee across Ontario, and sometimes they can be difficult to tell apart. But one way that we often use to tell them apart <clears throat> is the, the banding patterns and the coloration on their bodies. Because they're so big, you can tell pretty easily, you can see pretty clearly the different segments on their bodies. 
Um, next slide, please. And we can use the, the coloration. Oh, sorry. Um, previous slide. Oh, uh, OK, sorry. There's a slide uh, um, potentially missing, but that's fine. Um, back to the, the, the Bumblebee slide. Um, but you can see the coloration, the different bands on their bodies. We can use these to tell them apart. In this case, we have two different species of bee. Uh, we have a yellow-banded bumblebee and an orange-belted bumblebee. Um, and you know you can tell like the names pretty much give them away. One of these has a you know an awesome yellow band on it. The other has a bright orange one. Um, and so we can tell the, the different species apart sometimes quite easily by the banding patterns that they have on it. But there's a lot of variation, so it's it's not a surefire one either. On websites like Bumblebee Watch, you can find great resources for recognizing these different banding patterns of bumblebees. Um, and soon enough, you might be an expert of, of being able to tell them apart in your garden or or your favorite place to go. Some of the other groups of bees that we have are uh, metallic sweat bees. Um, and these are, are fascinating little bees. Um, there's a whole group of bees called sweat bees, and they're pretty well known for you know, sometimes landing on you if you're in the middle of a hike and drinking the sweat up off your arm uh, or off your, off your boot or, or shirt or whatever. Um, and uh, they're, they're really cool. When I first saw them, I was stunned that that we could have such a bright green, you know, insect. Um, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, they're they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, they range from solitary to social as well. So often they live on their own as, as solitary bees. That's pretty common. Most bees don't live in colonies or hives. They do uh, everything on their own as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, two of the other really cool groups of bees that we have here are minor bees. Uh, and mason bees. Um, both of these are, are usually solitary bees as well. Um, and minor bees will dig holes in the ground, like their name suggests. You sometimes see them poking up out of little holes in your garden or your, uh, um, of your garden. Um, and they'll build their nests inside these little holes that they dig in the ground. Um, mason bees, uh, also solitary, usually live on their own. And what I love about mason bees, so this picture is of a blue orchard bee. And just like those metallic sweat bees, this is a color I would never expect to see in a bee. Um, you usually consider, you know, the typical bee is yellow and black, um, but these orchard bees can be you know, really vibrant type of navy blues. And it's really startling if you see them in the sun. Um, absolutely incredible. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the last two groups that I'll talk about are leaf cutter bees, which are also really amazing if you ever have the, the, the pleasure of watching one cut a leaf a piece of a leaf off, a, off of a flat, off of a plant and, and fly off with it. Really amazing. They'll build these little apartments um, uh, made out of these pieces of leaf while the, while they're, where they will lay their, their eggs and, um, and pack with food for their larvae. Um, and then the, the larvae will hatch from them and eat the food and eventually emerge from these, uh, from these little apartments. And the last uh, group of bees that I'll mention are cuckoo bees. Um, I love cuckoo bees. I think they are really the, the villainous side to the bee world um, because most of them are, are solitary as well. Most of them are what we call kleptoparasites, which basically means that they um, steal and parasitize from other bees. Just like a cuckoo bird will lay its egg in the nest of other birds and that egg hatches and, and outcompetes the, the actual young of the parents that, it's, that the egg has been laid in, these cuckoo bees will lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. And so they might lay their egg inside one of these little uh, leaf cutter bee apartments, um, and the cuckoo bee egg will, will hatch faster, the larvae will develop faster, um, and it'll probably eat the other bee and, and all of that food that the parent has packed in, um, in for it. Uh, and so they're really the devious side of bees, um, whereas most bees are, are, you know, incredibly, you see them as being really beneficial, these cuckoo bees are the, the darker side of it. And they also tend to come in these really cool red colors, red and, and yellow colors. So they're really really neat to see in a fascinating life strategy that they have. Uh, next slide, please. There's one um, bees that I, that I haven't talked about, um, and you might have noticed that. I haven't mentioned honeybees in these, uh, in these wild bees. And there's a deliberate reason for that. I love honeybees. I think they're super cool. And they're obviously really important pollinators for a lot of the agriculture that we do in Ontario. But honeybees are not wild, and they're not native to Canada. Um, honeybees that we use here are the European honeybee, um, and uh, they're really cool organisms. But next slide, 
they're actually a lot closer to uh, farm animals like cows and chickens than they are to uh, the other wild bees that we have here in Ontario. And so as much as I love uh, honeybees and as, uh, as concerned as we might be uh, in terms of things like colony collapse disorder and other things that focus on honeybees specifically, <clears throat> when we're talking about wild bees and declines in wild bees, like I'll mention in a little bit, it's important to remember that honeybees are not wild. Um, if a honeybee had collapses, we can bring another one in um, from, their, from their native range or elsewhere, um, but we can't do the same thing for wild bees. We can't replace the wild bumblebees that we have here in Ontario. We can't replace the, the beautiful metallic green sweat bees or blue orchard bees that we have here in Ontario. Um, so an important thing to keep in mind, as cool as honeybees are, they're not wild and they're not native to Canada. Uh, next slide, please. Well, we've seen the, the beautiful diversity of, of shapes and colors and forms that bees can come in, but there's a whole really incredible diversity of life strategies as well that they have. Uh, we've seen a little bit of this with you know, these leafcutter bees making small apartments out of, out of pieces of leaf, uh, minor bees digging holes into the ground, bumblebees uh, you know, often nest in the ground as well or, or build these incredible colonies with little nectar pots inside of them. Um, and of course, carpenter bees as well. You know, it, might be, uh, it might be annoying and, and sometimes destructive when they're burrowing into our decks, um, but it's incredible that a bee has adapted to the life strategy of burrowing through wood um, to build this nest uh, and, and do its thing. So there's an incredible diversity of, uh, of life in pollinators. Uh, and we've just talked about bees so far. If we were gonna talk about the other pollinators that we have, uh, we'd be here for all day, as cool as that would be. Uh, next slide, please. All of these bees, in, in, incredible, in addition to being just so cool, um, also do the key thing of pollination. And so pollination, like like most of you will know, is the transfer of pollen between flowers for most flowers to, for any flower to make a seed and fruit and, and make more flowers, uh, it needs to be pollinated. Um, and so it, that means pollen needs to move from one part of the flower um, to the other part. And anywhere from 75 to 90% of flowers, next slide please, um, have animals help them with this pollination. A lot of flowers, a lot of plants like grasses um, or trees and trees, um, just kind of throw all their pollen into the wind and, and just by a numbers game, it ends up landing on other uh, plants of, of the same species and pollinating. Um, but most uh, flowers don't do that. Most flowering plants uh, use animals to move that pollen from flower to flower. And so there's a range of pollinators like we saw that do this, but bees play a huge role in that pollination. Uh, next slide, please. When it comes to the, the foods that we eat, so this pollination is not only critical for the landscapes that we have across Ontario and the rest of the world, um, but it's also really important for the foods that we eat too. Anywhere, about one out of three bites of food that we eat is because of pollinators, and it tends to be the most nutritious and delicious things on our plates as well. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, berries, um, these are the things that tend to be pollinated by animals, um, and a lot of the time by bees. Um, so without bees, we have a lot less color in our world uh, and a lot less um, color on our plates as well. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. One of the best pollinators that we have here in Ontario, uh, in Canada, are bumblebees. Um, they are, uh, like we've seen already, incredibly gorgeous animals. Um, they're fuzzy, they're thick. Um, because they're so large, because they're so hairy, they're able to keep warm. Uh, they're able to keep their bodies quite warm. Um, and unlike a lot of insects, which are ectothermic, which have their body temperature determined by the environment around them, bumblebees actually have a surprisingly high amount of control over their body temperature. So they can fly in really cold temperatures. They can also fly in actually relatively warm temperatures as well. Um, and so they're, they're really well adapted for our Ontario and our Canadian landscapes and pollinating within them. Often bumblebees will be some of the earliest bumblebees that uh, start pollinating in the spring. And they're often some of the um, bumblebees that are pollinating latest in the year in the fall as well. So they're really important for uh, pollinating these native landscapes because they're so large, they can also do what we call buzz pollination, which is important uh, for crops like tomatoes and others where they physically knock the pollen off of these flowers. And so without big pollinators like bumblebees, um, a, lot of some, a lot of flowers and a lot of crops would not be able to be pollinated. They can't be pollinated by smaller pollinators. <clears throat> so bumblebees, in addition to just being really beautiful, clearly really important. They also happen to be the, the group of animals that I study most from my research. Um, and they also sadly happen to be disappearing as well. 
Uh, next slide, please. Bumblebees across uh, Ontario, across uh, North America, and across the rest of, uh, and across most of the world, North America and Europe as well, um, are, are disappearing. Uh, next slide, please. And this is due to a mix of different things. Um, this is the, the main focal point of my research. And so I'll just talk a little bit about some of the reasons why we know that bumblebees are disappearing across North America and Europe and what we can do about it as well. Next slide. One of the biggest um, drivers of these disappearances in bumblebees is climate change. So as we uh, make greenhouse gases and other into the atmosphere, this drives climate change. And so we know that climate change brings warming, gradual warming every year, it tends to get warmer and warmer. But um, next slide, please. Um, the other thing that climate change does is increase the frequency and severity of extreme events. So things like heat waves, things like droughts are becoming more common um, and are lasting longer in the year and are reaching um, bigger highs as well. Um, this is something that we notice as people every year, it becomes harder and harder to live without air conditioning, for example, as the, you know, the heat waves in the summer that used to be a couple of days now end up being you know, a week that stretch out just longer and longer. Um, and without a fan sitting right beside you, um, summers are getting pretty uncomfortable here, even in Ontario. So climate change, these extreme events especially, tend to be really detrimental for bumblebees, not only in the summer, but also in the springs as well. Um, these heat waves in the spring can you know, wake up bumblebees from their, uh, from their hibernation, from their overwintering, um, and wake them up in a period of time when there aren't a lot of flowers to support these queens waking up and starting nests. So extreme events throughout the year can have a big impact on, on wild pollinators and bumblebees. Next slide, please. Um, habitat loss is another big driver of disappearances. Um, as we convert natural landscapes into more human dominated landscapes, um, like agriculture, urban, et cetera, um, this destroys habitat or resources or uh, places that thing and things that, that bees need. Um, next slide, please. And of course, things like pesticides as well. Um, can also play a huge role in the declines, especially at local scales. Things like diseases and parasites that are brought by uh, introduced species or other bees, including honeybees, um, can also just add to the pressures that, that bees face. Um, and all of this makes for a really um, kind of a really uh, toxic vortex of different pressures that bees have to face. And it's contributing to pretty big declines across uh, Canada and North America and Europe. Um, next slide, please. But there, are, so all of these things, uh, next slide again, make for some pretty unhappy um, bumblebees, um, unfortunately. But there are a lot of things that we can do um, to help turn that smile upside down, I guess. A lot of things that we can do to help bumblebees. Um, the, the bumblebees have declined a lot, but they don't need to keep continuing. Um, there's no need to imagine a world without pollinators. There are a lot of things we can do to stop getting to that point. One of the big things we can do, uh, next slide please, that really does help is uh, contributing to community science. Apps and websites like Bumblebee Watch and iNaturalist collect information on uh, bumblebees and other animals. Um, and they're not only great ways to learn about the world around you because they can help you identify things that you're seeing in nature, um, but they also collect all of that information and send it to researchers across the globe. So conservation biologists like me, like other colleagues across uh, Canada um, can use that information to figure out exactly how climate change and habitat loss and other things are, are threatening bees and exactly what we can do about it to develop better conservation solutions um, that will help save these, these bees and other pollinators. Um, next slide, please. The other thing that you can do that, that, uh, that is a lot of fun and also helps uh, native uh, pollinator populations is pollinator gardens. Um, this is something that won't just help bees, it will help the other diversity of pollinators that we have in Ontario as well, things like hummingbirds and butterflies, beetles and moths. Um, and so a, a properly managed pollinator garden can really make a big difference. It's like providing an island of habitat in the middle of, uh, of a, a desert that urban environments often are. Uh, next slide, please. There are a couple important things to note or take note of if you're making a pollinator garden. The first is planting native wildflowers you wanna to try to mimic in your pollinator garden the same habitats and plants uh, that are gonna be seen you know, 30 minutes outside of your city uh, in, the, in the wild. So uh, Pollinator Partnerships has a, a great series of guides um, where, that are specific to your region across Ontario, to your kind of biome or ecosystem that you, dominant ecosystem that you live in. 
Um, and so if you're curious about what type of wildflowers are best to plant in a garden, um, download one of these guides and check out what type of native wildflowers are best for the pollinators that live near you. Next slide, please. One of the other uh, great things to do, really important things to do in a pollinator garden is provide structure. Um, bees uh, take a lot more than just uh, flowers and nectar from landscapes. The landscapes are also um, nesting habitat or wintering habitat. And often um, as extreme temperatures, as climate change gets worse, um, small animals, including bees, use microhabitats, microrefugia in a landscape to help shelter from the heat. And so what I mean by this is things like soil. When temperatures get too hot, small animals go into the soil, they'll go under logs, they'll go into piles of leaves, um, they'll go into little, little microhabitats, which will help them buffer against extreme temperatures or conditions in general. And so if your garden has a nice diversity of, of structures and habitats, if it has a mix of shrubs and bushes, if it has uh, you know, piles of leaves from the fall and, uh, and, and logs or twigs on the ground, um, then this is not only providing potential nesting habitat, potential places for them to spend the winter, but it's also providing them places to go when temperatures get too hot, when conditions get too extreme, um, pollinator gardens can be really important places for them to weather these storms. Um, so that's another really critical thing you can do. And places like BCD Canada have some great resources on how to add in these types of structures into your pollinator garden. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of course, these are only two of, of any number of things you can do to help, uh, to help biodiversity and pollinators more broadly. Um, there's a huge range of things that, uh, that I won't go over today, but I will mention one of them. Um, and it's uh, engaging with, with organizations like Ontario Nature, places like uh, things like Be the Change program that, that Jessica mentioned, um, things like the Ontario Youth Council are doing are incredible ways of, of just engaging people uh, and getting people, uh, your friends, your neighbors, um, to care about pollinators as well. Uh, and of course, one of the most important things that we can do to help pollinators and bees and biodiversity more broadly is voting for uh, decision makers who, who also care about these things and recognize the importance. Um, and hopefully the beauty of these wild pollinators that we have in Ontario. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna end this with, uh, with a challenge for everybody um, to take five or 10 minutes after this talk and plan out your pollinator garden. You don't have to make a pollinator garden, but just think about where you would put it. Do you have a bit of backyard you could section off? Um, do you have a balcony you could put a little, uh, a little area on? Um, is there a community garden near you or, or some sort, sort of uh, terrace or place you could do it? Um, just think about where you would put it and, and what sort of flowers and what sort of structures you would aim for in your garden. You don't have to do it, but just think about if you were to do it, uh, what would you do for your pollinator garden? And uh, next slide, please. I can promise if you do that, I'll be happy. And you'll also be making a lot of um, happy pollinators and happy bees as well. So on that note, thank you again for Ontario Nature for the invitation. Um, to, to come here and, and geek out about pollinators. Thank you uh, to everyone for watching and listening. And, um, and of course, thank you to the bees and all of the beautiful pollinators that we have here for, for being so inspiring and, and just so dope. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Peter. So we have a lot of questions in the Q&A right now. So uh, for the questions that we are unable to answer, we will uh, follow up over email. Uh, but to get started on a couple of questions that have shown up in the chat relating to native bees, uh, does having honey bee hives detrimentally affect populations of wild native bees? That's a great question. Um, I think there's, uh, there's, you know, some evidence to show that um, honeybees can outcompete uh, native bees in the environments. And so if we have a lot of honeybees in a place, for an example, that removes a lot of resources that wild bees will use or require as well. Um, and so it's it's tough to tell how big an impact this have this can have. Um, the advice I would say if you're, you know, if you want to have a honeybee hive, that's great. Honeybees are cool for a lot of reasons. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of, you know, really great reasons to want honeybee hives. Um, but if you're interested in saving wild pollinator populations and wild bees, then the best thing to do isn't to get a honeybee hive, it's to do, um, you know, to build pollinator gardens um, and, and focusing on the, the wild pollinators that we have. Um, so I think that's a difficult question. Um, in theory, honeybees can remove uh, resources from the, 
from the environment for native bees, um, but they're still cool on their own as well. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, are bumblebee numbers in decline in Ontario? Heard some places there is a 97% decline in bumblebees. Wow, yeah, that's really big. Um, I don't uh, I don't know if I've heard that number, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Um, yeah, bumblebees in general across um, across most of the globe, most of the places that we're looking pretty intensely seem to be declining. There are some species that do that are doing really well, that are really well able to take advantage of these changing climates and of uh, human disturbances. But most species, it looks like, are not able to take advantage of that. Um, in Ontario, we have a couple really, um, really good and sad examples of bees that are declining. Bombus aphanus, the rusty patch bumblebee, is, is one of the poster children of, of declining bees. Um, this used to be a bee that was, you know, a couple decades ago, super common across Ontario and would be one of the most common bees you see in places. Um, and now it's, it's extirpated from Canada. We haven't seen it here in since, since 2009, I believe, um, despite looking really hard in places where we know this bee used to be. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, bees are declining. Um, I don't know if the 97% if is a, a number of where that's from, um, but it's a, even if the bees aren't declining by 97% everywhere, um, any percent is, is still pretty concerning. Thanks, Peter. Um, should I be concerned if bumblebees have established a colony inside the external brickwork of my home? Other than that, I'd rather read them in order or skim for the, oh, never mind. Yeah, that's the question. Should I be concerned if bumblebees have established a colony inside the external brickwork of my home? Um, oh, that's another good question. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest, um, I'm, I'm not a homeowner, so I can't give you um, super great advice on that. Um, bees are, one thing I'll say though, is bees are usually quite gentle. Um, we often get really stressed out when we know that there are colonies or nests of, uh, of bees near us. Um, but, you know, usually they're, they're, it's very unlikely, or usually they, you know, they don't go out of their way to sting you. Um, bumblebees, for example, depending on what type of bee is nesting, um, usually the, the rule of thumb is that, you know, if you're not bothering them, um, then they won't bother you. Um, so obviously it depends what sort of place it is, but I have on my balcony a nest of, of wasps actually that has been there all summer and I'm out there all the time and they're, they're fine. So it's up to you what you're comfortable with, um, but uh, usually bees are, are surprisingly gentle and wasps as well actually. Okay. Great. Thanks Peter, there's so many questions. <laughs> um, there's one bee that I, uh, one, so I guess you answer that question of do all bees sting? So uh, you've pretty much answered that question live. Um, there's a question here about um, given flies, wasps, and bees can look similar, what's the main difference in why they get classified that way? Oh, that's a really cool question. Um, there are, uh, that's a really cool question. Um, I, uh, I mean, there are, there are, they look quite similar. Um, and, you know, when we think of, for example, like a housefly, and a bumblebee, they're, they're very different. Um, the, the difficulty gets when, especially in flies, a lot of flies mimic bumblebees or other bees deliberately. Um, as we know, bees sting, and I guess I'll touch on that question a little bit. Most bees sting, pretty much all bees sting. Uh, honeybees are notorious for only being able to sting once. Um, and, uh, but most other bees, especially most wild bees that we have, can sting actually as many times as they want. They don't have those barbed stingers that honeybees do that rip out when they sting. Um, and so most bees, if they want, can sting more than once. They rarely do. Um, and actually most male bees don't sting and a lot of uh, some entire groups of bees don't, don't sting either. Um, but when we think of bumblebees and, um, and others, those, those can sting. Um, and so it's, it's helpful for animals like flies, which are you know pretty harmless aside from their annoyance, uh, annoying factor, um, it's really helpful for them to be able to mimic some of these bees that have a really good defense mechanism. Um, and so that's why we see, you know, things like these hoverflies and surfer flies and others that look really similar to, uh, to bees. But fundamentally, they're still very different. Um, you know, we looked at those, they have, flies have one pairs of wing, whereas bees have two pairs of wing. Um, you know, even the, the number of body segments is not quite different. Um, and so there, there are some good reasons, you know, um, from like a, 
um, a taxonomy perspective to classify them into different groups. But once we get to these like, you know, really interesting fringe groups, um, then it gets quite difficult. And you start to wonder why, why are these wasps wasps? And why are these bees bees? Why aren't they kind of the same thing? Um, another interesting difference though, now that I mentioned between bees and wasps is that most wasps are, are carnivorous and most bees are, are herbivorous. Um, so there's a, a really, you know, it's kind of the vegan versus the uh, versus the meditarian um, version of these animals as well. Great, thanks, Kira. We have a, time for a, a couple more questions. Um, what was the source that you said was good to identify bumblebees? Oh yeah, that was um, Bumblebee Watch. Um, so if you Google Bumblebee Watch, um, there's a Bumblebee Watch is a is a community science citizen science uh, website program platform. Um, which is super great for identifying bees, helping to identify bees, for helping to log that information. Um, and uh, it has some great resources on how to tell apart different species of bumblebee. Um, so if you, if you visit bumblebeewatch.org, I think, or dot, uh, yeah, bumblebeewatch.org, um, that's where you can find some great resources for bumblebees. And another great place to go, if you've just taken a picture of a bee or a, an insect and you're not sure what it is, putting it on iNaturalist is another great way to be able to tell apart, to be able to identify what organism you're looking at. iNaturalist has a lot of great um, computer generated identifications that are often really accurate, surprisingly accurate. Um, and it also has people that are going through all these observations that people upload um, and, and, and can help uh, identify them with you as well. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, can you give some suggestions on flowers that will attract pollinators? I see a bunch of flowers on this slide here, but maybe you could uh, provide some, maybe a list of ones that you've seen um, that can help with this question. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in the spring, one of the, one of the really cool flowers that you'll see often some of the earliest blooming ones are, are actually trees, things like uh, pear trees and apple trees or other trees or some of the first blooming ones um, that will come out that can give a lot of really great uh, sources of, uh, of nectar and pollen for, for bees. Um, uh, the names of flowers, of, of other flowers are escaping me at the moment. Uh, on this picture, there are a couple uh, thistles, um, some daisies, asters are often Quite good, I think, for uh, for bees and pollinators. But the best way to do, and especially given that there's such a variety of, of different biomes and other things across Ontario, the best thing to do is probably visit somewhere like pollinatorpartnerships.org and the, guard, the guides that they have, um, or visit your uh, you know plant nurseries near you. Will probably also know uh, what type of, of native wildflowers are uh, are kind of common to your region too. But great question. A great question. Um, yes, and there's there's plenty of uh, native plant nurseries in the province that you can you can check out, and they have a list of of, of, of native plants that are beneficial for pollinators. Um, and yeah, so thank you to Jessica. We are out of time. Thank you to Jessica and Peter for uh, sharing the work that you've done for our pollinators. Um, to wrap up our webinar, um, a recording of this webinar will be posted on Ontario Nature's YouTube channel, and we'll link it in the follow-up email that will be sent in a few days. Um, Ontario Nature is helping pollinators and other at-risk species by implementing nature-based solutions to increase resilience to our changing climate, you can find out now how by visiting ontarionature.org slash campaigns slash climate change. Again, thank you to Peter and Jessica for joining us today and to all of you. So take good care and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.